Um, I'm Abby. Thank you for coming. This is the cloud operations track. Um, we're going to be talking about containers today. It'll be me for a little bit, and then it will be uh, Shimon Toltz from, from Detree. So uh, welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Um, we'll also save some time for questions at the end, by the way, with both Shimon and I. So if you have, if you have a question, um, just save it till the end, and we'll, we'll do them all at once, because someone else probably has the same question. Um, so first things first, um, how many people have worked with containers before? How many people are using them in production? It always weeds off like 20% of the people and we're like, ooh. Um, so if you're one of those folks that did not raise your hand, um, what are containers and, and why are so many people using them? Um, it's just a package of software that includes everything that it needs to run. So binaries, libraries, packages, they're all wrapped together in, in kind of one piece. Uh, a really popular and, and widely used uh, platform for this is something called Docker. Uh, the concepts that have been around forever, so since uh, Jails and Solaris um, and Zones and FreeBSD and C groups. Um, so the, the concepts have been around for a while, but I think Docker made that kind of a, a more widely used and easily consumed format. So I worked in DevOps, which everyone knows and a startup also means IT, so hopefully I can continue fixing my own HDMI inputs, but Maybe not. I'm really afraid, by the way, that if the, the HDMI port on my laptop goes out, which has, has been known to do, that I'm going to have to upgrade to the new Macs, which are the ones that have no ports. And then I'll be the person carrying around. Like I watched my boss take his laptop out yesterday. Very small, very beautiful laptop and two whole entire bags of dongles. <laughs> so I'm not really sure if it makes the aesthetics work or not when you have to carry around this like whole giant tangle of dongles. Um, so. What are people using and, and kind of why are they using it? Obviously, containers have kind of picked up a lot of steam over the last couple of years, right? So you're seeing more and more people not only kind of use them as, as ways to do dev and test environments, but you're seeing them run their entire production workloads on there. Um, they're really portable. They're really lightweight. So you can wrap everything that you need to run your application inside that one package. Um, and that means that you can deploy that same package everywhere. So from a local environment to a test environment to a staging environment to a production environment, then it makes it really easy to replicate. So part of a, a problem for people testing in the past is, well, it worked on my machine. Or I tried this in production. It doesn't work in production, but it worked on staging. And you end up in a situation where none of your environments are really the same. Um, and a big reason that people started using these containers for testing environments was that they could make them the same that by deploying the same container to their local environment and then to their staging environment and then to their production environment, they've kind of been able to do this to, to not only solve a lot of the development and testing problems, but they, they can use them in production as well. So they end up with these really repeatable, really easily deployed environments. Um, and then it, it, um, it used to be that the, the main way that people deployed their applications was, with, was in a monolith. So one big kind of giant piece of, of code, everything was all in the same repository, the same application. So you had one application that had many functions. So uh, your same application would handle things like orders and uh, UI and inventory and stuff like that. Um, and with containers came a, a new architecture choice. So you'd have uh, a web service and a UI service and uh, an inventory service. Um, but you have some problems, right? So running one container locally is, is really easy. You can start it in a couple of minutes. Um, it's not very hard. Um, but there's still some moving pieces that are involved in the container, right? So everything's wrapped up in that same piece, but there's some, there's some more kind of stuff that goes around, uh, around orchestrated needs. So you have your app code itself. You have all your dependencies. You have the operating system of the server that you're running it on. And these are all problems, right, that the more containers that you run, so with monolith to microservices, right, you start off with one piece and you end up with many. And there are a lot of benefits from this, right, because I can scale a little bit more efficiently, I can pack, I can use my resources a little bit more effectively. Um, but there's some, there's some kind of baggage that goes around with this, and that's something that, that AWS usually calls um, undifferentiated heavy lifting. So there's a lot of work that goes into making sure that you can kind of get all the benefits out of these containers. And the more containers that you add, the more these problems are kind of compounded. So if you have just one container, not a big deal, even if it's a really inefficient one. So say I write a 10 gigabyte container. That's only 10 gigabytes, right? It's only one, one container. But then what happens when I have 50 containers, 100 containers, 10,000 containers? Now they're all 10 gigabytes, and now I have no disk space. 
Um, so enter container orchestration tools. So that would be something like ECS or Kubernetes or Docker Swarm. Um, and that's a framework for managing kind of all of those hard bits. I don't know what's happening with the lights, by the way, but <laughs> I'm into it. It's totally fine. Um, it's mood lighting. Um, so basically, frameworks for all of these, what AWS would call pain points. So how do I deploy, manage, and scale my software when I have thousands of moving pieces instead of just one moving piece? Um, so what's that look like on AWS? Um, obviously, this is the AWS Summit, so that's what most of you are here for. Um, so what are your options on AWS for, for these container orchestration tools? Um, so you have Amazon ECS, uh, the OG. It's available now. It's been around for a while. It's in multiple regions. Uh, you have Amazon EKS, which is the Amazon Elastic, Elastic Container Service for Kubernetes. Uh, that's in preview right now. You have Fargate mode for ECS, um, which is available now, but only in US East 1, which is kind of like a preview. Uh, and then you have Fargate mode for EKS, uh, which is uh, available sometime in 2018. Um, I know, by the way, that today is also 2018, and that day is not today, um, but another day in 2018. Um, so ECS, uh, probably pretty familiar to, to some of you in this room. Um, who's used ECS before? Me too. Um, so being around for a while, uh, integration with, with most of the, the rest of the AWS platform, so things like load balancers and auto scaling and Beanstalk and Parameter Store, um, uh, scales to support clusters of, of any size, um, service integrations like ALB are at the container level. Uh, I think that's been a theme, by the way, also. Um, so more and more kind of integrations happening at the container level for ECS. So things like security groups and load balancing, uh, these task placement policies, they're all kind of treating our task as our fundamental compute primitive. So instead of having to jump back out to EC2 to manage things when my infrastructure is running in containers, um, I can do everything more granularly at the container level. So like load balancing or security or task roles. Um, what happened with, with ECS in, in 2017? Um, so tons of features, supports for new kinds of load balancers, support for cron jobs, support for override parameters for start and run task, um, some extra support for things like Docker privilege mode or more Linux capabilities. Um, so growing and, and kind of getting better and improving all the time. Uh, and we drive our roadmap based on what you all want. So we drive that based on customer feedback. So things that you've been asking for, things that you want to play with, things that you want to be able to use, um, that's what powers the, the AWS roadmap. Um, so then you have EKS, which we announced at reInvent um, in 2017, so the one that we just had. Um, that's managed Kubernetes for, for AWS. So managed Kubernetes control plane, um, and you can get help with some things like high availability. Uh, you can opt in to things like version upgrades if you choose to. Um, to answer a lot of kind of frequently asked questions before they're asked, um, it is just regular Kubernetes, but managed on AWS. So it's not special AWS Kubernetes, it's just the regular Kubernetes. Um, we'll contribute back upstream. So if we make a change or if we have something like the CNI plugin um, that other people will want to use, uh, we'll contribute that back. So by using Kubernetes, I think part of, part of what makes Kubernetes so attractive to people is, is the community. So being able to participate in a, in a really rich open source community of people writing tools and plugins and fixing bugs. And um, we want to be a part of that too. So we'll continue to kind of keep upstream, pass our changes back, and then also make sure that the Kubernetes that you can run on AWS is the same as you can run anywhere else. Um, and then you have Fargate. Uh, so Fargate is not its own service. Uh, it's an underlying technology. And we'll, we'll dig into a, a lot of details on this in a second, and that's what Shimon is going to talk about as well. Um, it ultimately, ultimately takes the cluster layer out of working with, with ECS. So manage everything at the container level, so everything in your task definition and container definition, um, and then all of the underlying cluster infrastructure you no longer manage. So you just do everything at the container level, uh, and then coming soon, sometime in 2018, uh, you can do the same thing uh, for, Kube for EKS uh, with a pod as your definition rather than the task definition. Um, so what does that mean kind of in practice? It means you don't worry about things like choosing the right AMI or choosing the right instance type or when do I scale and how do I scale. Uh, you don't worry about capacity planning or something like this, which would be an example of how we need Fargate for conference rooms. Um, 
I just gave it a task definition, or later in 2018, a pod, and then I just let Fargate handle everything else. And this is the best description that I've ever found. Of it, found. Um, I can't credit this quote, by the way, because I stole it from an Amazon office, and I don't know who said it. Um, but if it was you, let me know. Um, for those of you that can't see, though, when someone asks you for a sandwich, they aren't asking you to put them in charge of a global sandwich logistic, logistics chain. They just want a sandwich. And Fargate is, is just the sandwich. I don't want to know how you make bread or how you cut pieces of turkey or how many pieces of cheese that I, I, that I need. I just want a sandwich. Um, so if you want to run a, a managed container in AWS, and obviously you can run non-managed containers in AWS, so people just run Docker on EC2. Uh, people run just Kubernetes on EC2. It's a really popular choice right now. But if you want to run a managed container in AWS, um, and this picture, by the way, is assuming things in general availability. So this is kind of what the whole picture looks like. Right now, you don't have quite of all these options, but uh, that's the big picture. Uh, you choose your orchestration tool. So either what is uh, still called ECS, but the, the Amazon orchestration tool, uh, or you pick uh, the Amazon Kubernetes service. Once you've chosen that, you have two different modes uh, for tasks that you run inside of that, uh, inside of that service. Either EC2 mode, which is the traditional one, manage your infrastructure, uh, or you have Fargate mode, um, which is don't manage any of the infrastructure, just work on your task. So it ends up looking like a decision tree. I pick my orchestration tool, and then I pick my launch type. Um, another frequently asked question, how do I know when to use Fargate versus EC2? Um, depends on what you're running in it. So if you can control everything at the task definition, the container definition, so all of your dependencies and libraries and binaries, um, Fargate's a great choice. If you need something like access to the underlying cluster hosts or being able to exec into that running container, um, EC2 mode is the right choice for you. The same as if you um, are using a, a customized AMI or you're running daemon processes on the EC2 host. Um, those are all things that are possible in EC2 mode that are not possible in Fargate mode. So it depends on kind of how you're running things and, and what your workload looks like uh, so you can figure out which one is right for you. Um, there are some differences also. Uh, probably the most significant is a change in networking mode. Um, so if you've been using Docker for a while, there are uh, a number of different networking types, uh, bridge, uh, net, host, and none. Um, you'll notice that this is none of those. Um, it's its own networking mode called AWS VPC. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, you only specify container port, no host port. Uh, that means that uh, for the up to 10 container definitions that can be part of a task definition, they all must use different ports. Uh, no links, you can only use the local loopback interface. You can't use actually links, which is actually deprecated in Docker also. Um, no ELB classic, only ALB or NLB. For ALB, you have to use target type IP and not instance. Um, and you have to have your launch type as, as Fargate. Um, you can, though, which I know Shimon is going to talk about later, but you can run things, you can run hybrid clusters. So uh, there's a, a flag called requires compatibilities. Uh, to work with Fargate, you need the Fargate flag. You can also flag tasks as being compatible with both EC2 mode and Fargate mode. Um, so you can pass in both. Um, I can also run clusters that have types, uh, tasks of, of, of both types. So I can run a, a task of type EC2 next to a type named Fargate, uh, and I can switch them back and forth. So I can flip my task from type EC2 to type Fargate and then back again. Um, so you can do that on the fly, but it also, I think, makes for a really strong migration path. So I'm able to, to kind of migrate really easily and then, because once I've gotten the compatibilities right, all it is is, is changing a flag. Um, hang on, what's AWS VPC? So this is basically task level networking. It means each task is allocated an ENI and a private IP from your subnet. If you're working with Fargate, you can also optionally allocate a public IP. Um, it, it, it means basically simpler container networking. Um, so containers on the same instance as part of the same task can speak via the local loopback interface, which is more commonly known as localhost or 127.0.0.1. Um, alternatively, they can communicate with each other outside that same host via the ENI or host name or, or the private IP. Um, I've included links, by the way, throughout the whole presentation. So if you're looking for um, some extra info or some reading, um, when the slides go out, uh, you'll be able to, to click on all the links and kind of look through things at, at your leisure. 
Um, I included another one for some help on migrating between Fargate and EC2. So if you listen to Shimon talking about how they did it at Tatree, and then you're interested in kind of doing the same thing, um, there are some resources out to help you. Um, it shouldn't be a ton of it shouldn't be a ton of lift, which Shimon can talk to, but um, definitely some changes mostly around the networking type. So some research to to look into before you before you switch. Um, I'm not going to read this out loud, but if you're looking for the slides um, afterwards, I included a couple um, some some more details on the differences between the three. Um, I also included another another link to a post by one of the container developer advocates that some of you have probably interacted with. Uh, his name is Nathan Peck, and he wrote a, a blog post on how to choose the right environment for you. So also worth a look um, if you're if you're trying to get started. Um, Get by with a little help from my friends. Um, how can you kind of work with all of these tools in a, a fairly, for AWS, a, a very large ecosystem? Um, so there are two CLIs um, for Fargate and ECS that are official. Uh, the first one is the AWS CLI, and that's the main one that works for almost all the services. I can talk to, to Lambda, EC2, uh, Beanstalk, and ECS all with the same CLI. Uh, it's open source. There's some links in there as well. Uh, there's also a second CLI for ECS and, and now ECS with Fargate mode uh, that's called the ECS CLI. Um, also official, um, only works for those two services. Um, the main difference there is that it accepts Docker Compose files. So if you're interested in using the Docker Compose format, you can use that CLI. Um, I always kind of stuck with the AWS CLI because it meant that I could just use one CLI rather than needing to use both. But uh, some people, I think, are very attached to Docker Compose, and, and that's the way that you can do that on AWS. Um, there's also some really good unofficial ones. So one that I really like for Fargate is the Fargate CLI. Um, it's made by one of the AWS SAs. Um, that I fe feels very much like the, like the Docker CLI, so Fargate task run X. Fargate task run nginx, Fargate stop nginx. So um, definitely worth a worth a look. I included a link for you. Um, there's also one that works for ECS and Fargate called the Cold Brew CLI that a lot of people are are quite happy with. Um, there's also a ton of resources out there that you can you can turn to if you're looking for a little bit of help. Uh, so the first one that some of you may have contributed to is is called Awesome ECS. It's maintained by Nathan Peck again. It's open source. Um, a big, huge collection of blogs and workshops and demos and talks and projects that people have built uh, around the, the containers ecosystem on AWS. Um, so worth a look. Uh, there's also a bunch of workshops. So for Fargate, there's a, something like a first run wizard, basically, that when you go to the Fargate and the console, it will help you kind of walk through setting up what a Fargate task looks like. Um, that's fine. I think if you're looking for a little bit more of a really solid level of detail that kind of ends with an application set up from start to finish. Um, there are some workshops that you can, you can do on your own um, that I think are a little bit uh, possibly easier to follow than kind of teaching yourself everything through the documentation. Um, so this is one for, for Fargate. It's by another one of the container DAs named Brent. Um, there's also a bunch of Kubernetes ones. Um, Arun Gupta has a Kubernetes and AWS workshop as well. I didn't link to this one because Arun himself is here. So he's talking about Kubernetes. So I think he'll have a link for you. Um, so I gave someone else some airtime instead. Uh, so this is Nathan Peck, again, um, with a workshop that I actually think he gave in Tel Aviv a couple, a couple weeks ago. So some of you might have, have gone to the same workshop. Uh, there's tons of workshops. Um, if, you're, if you're looking at the, at the stuff on, on GitHub afterwards, um, these are all uh, public and, and open for you to kind of to walk through. I know that um, they're all hosted on GitHub also, so I think everyone that's, that's running those workshops is, is totally open to, to feedback as well. So if you've not been able to, to do one of those workshops in person, um, you're looking to get started with something like Fargate or ECS or Kubernetes on AWS, um, I very much recommend kind of starting there, but also if you have a problem running through the workshop, like hey, I had to look this up, or you know what, this setting doesn't quite work anymore, um, open a pull request. And it's something that I'm going to talk about at the, at the end too, but your, your best resource for help is from people like 
everyone else sitting in this room around you. They're interested in the same things that you're interested in. They're working on the same kinds of projects. And I think it's too bad when people work in, in a vacuum, right? So I work on that. And don't be that person that writes a question on Stack Overflow and then comes back seven months later and says, never mind. Um, don't be that person. Um, if, you, if you fix something, if you figure out how something works, if you have a question, um, Share it with us, share it with everyone else, uh, write a blog post, open a PR, um, comment on someone else's issue. Um, that way we can all kind of make the community a little bit better by, by giving back. This is Shimon from Detree. Um, he's gonna come up and talk a little bit about their, their path migrating from, from ECS and EC2 mode to Fargate. And then um, if you hang out for a second afterwards, we will both stick around to, to answer some, some questions after. Um, so. Uh, without further ado, I will pass it off to Shimon. Hey, hey. Oh, thank you very much, Abby. Uh, thanks for having me here. I hope that the HDMI gods will be with us and that I will be able to do this presentation with you. So today I'm gonna to talk with you about how we migrated our production environment into running on ECS Fargate. So I'll talk a little bit about how we did it, what were the challenges, how we overcome them, and why we even decided to do that. So first of all, my name is Shimon Toltz. Uh, that's a funny picture of me almost 10 years ago uh, when we received the server at our lab and I was very, very, very happy. Unfortunately, or fortunately, today we don't have any servers at our company. I'm the CTO and co-founder at the Tree, and we don't even have any EC2 instances today. We only have containers and serverless functions. So I'm also the AWS community hero in Israel, and we actually have a stand uh, at the AWS booth where you can get a AWS falafel sticker so be sure to check out our stand and get a sticker for yourself. So um, as I said, I'm the CTO and co-founder of The Tree. So The Tree is a catalog of code components, projects, and people. So basically, we connect to the customer's uh, source control, such as GitHub, and provide a layer of immediate insights for the R&D department. So basically, we help companies enhance their collaboration and sync their developers in order to gain more visibility into all of their stack. So I'll start by talking a little bit of what we had and how we run our, our uh, environment at the tree. So first of all, as a philosophy, we like running stuff as a service. We don't want to run any instances. We don't want to babysit any clusters because it has nothing to do with our business. We just want things to work and we want to write our applications. So as you can see, our, we use many different uh, services such as X-Ray and uh, Fargate and RDS and basically we do everything as a service in order to do so. And we have more than 200 NPM code components and over 40 uh, GitHub projects. So, what made us move and migrate our environment into uh, Fargate, which is a fairly new, new service. It was announced in reInvent. It is only available in one uh, region, as Abby said, but uh, we still wanted to do so. And for us, it's very important to focus on our customers and to deliver features as fast as possible. We don't want to deal with EC2 instances and AMIs and babysitting auto-scaling groups that will scale up our fleet. It has nothing to do with our business and we just don't want to do so. It allowed us to stop worrying about Linux patching. We don't need to take care of our Docker daemon. We don't need to update our ECS agent. And another thing that is very, very important to our customers is security and compliance. Because we actually connect to our customers' source control, which is the holy grail for any company. So you can imagine that security is the number one priority for us. And since March 1st, Fargate is actually certified with SOC 2, HIPAA, and PCI DSS. So I call it security as a service. <laughs> My team doesn't need to do that because we get it ready and uh, we can just run our containers on top of the fleet. 
So today, this is how our service looks like. So instead of actually doing all of the uh, heavy lifting, as Avi said, we just run on Fargate. And we don't have to take care of uh, all of the underlying infrastructure. And we are very happy with it because we can focus on our business. So some other benefits from using ECS and Fargate are the ease of use. Because first of all, you have log management integrated within ECS. You just check a box, and you ship all of your logs into CloudWatch, which is very, very convenient and very nice. Because now we have a centralized location for all of our microservices to write logs into. And we have tens and tens of microservices doing various different stuff. Another thing is that by using Fargate, we were free from actually doing task distribution and bean packing and trying to understand what is the right capacity and to try to jungle two different scaling metrics. Because one is scaling containers and the other is actually scaling the fleet itself. So it made lots of sense to us. It helped us with cost savings. Because instead of having to provision soft and hard limits to determine the amount of memory that we think that we need to reserve for a specific container, now we just say how much memory we want, how much CPU, and that's it. And it just works out of the box. So we are very, very happy with that. So in terms of how we did the migration itself, so maybe I convinced you. Maybe you say to yourself, OK, now I'm going to move my production environment into running on Fargate. So the way to do so is, or the way we did it, is service by service. So our stack works the following way. We have a Route 53 DNS that is mapped into an ALB that is then routed into a service by service. So for us, it was fairly easy. We created a new task definition. We switched our network mode to AWS VPC as Abby stated, we changed our uh, compatibilities to be uh, configured to run with Fargate. And we just specified the amount of CPU and memory. And we ran the new service. And actually, I was pretty amazed of how easy it was. You just update those settings, and it just works for you. And um, as Abby said, a hybrid mode is also possible. So today, we're not running in hybrid mode. As I said, we have zero instances. But during the migration phase, we actually ran a mixed cluster of Fargate and an EC2 fleet. So for us, it really made sense. We have no special requirements as to executing into our containers or doing any special heavy lifting or needing any GPU-optimized instances or we're just running microservices the classical, simple way. So it really, really made sense to us. But um, you know, when doing those transitions, there are still some challenges. And it was very important for me to also talk about the challenges. Because every time you go to a summit, people talk about the beautiful things. But sometimes there are also challenges. But I think that they are fairly um, OK, and we overcame them. So the first one that we noticed immediately is that now deploying containers onto Fargate takes up to 10 minutes. And I think that it's a, it's a perspective. So one would say it used to take two to three minutes on ECS, EC2. Why does it take now 10 minutes? It's a lot of time. But actually, for us, it doesn't make any difference at all. Because the way we work is that we have a full CI CD pipeline that once a developer commits a code into GitHub, a Travis job is triggered, a container is built and pushed into ECR. And then we use a nice ECS deploy script, which I will link. And this is a very simple script that just creates a new task definition and updates the service to run the fresh container. So actually, for me, to have myself and my developers a ship code into production in under 10 minutes from the moment they write the code until it's running on the ECS Fargate cluster is amazing. And for us, it was not a real challenge because everything is automated. And actually, in a moment, I'll show you a template with all of our automations that we actually open sourced for you so you will be able to use them for yourself. 
The second challenge that we faced uh, during this migration was the fact that scheduled tasks are no longer, or not yet, I don't know, maybe Abby can say, supported on uh, ECS Fargate. So we had some um, scheduled uh, tasks, and once we shut down our uh, production cluster ECS fleet, we noticed that they just stopped running because it's not supported on Fargate. So one very easy and nice solution to that is actually to use the Lambda scheduler because Lambda has a great scheduler and it works really, really well. And actually you can invoke a task via the uh, Lambda scheduler. So the way it works is that um, you schedule the amount that you, uh, the time that you want your task to run and it just invokes through Lambda into an ECS task and it just works. Um, I think that it's a fair solution. You could do other things like convert it into a service, but I think that this is one of the best ways to do so. So as I said, we've open sourced a template that you can use in order to deploy your code into production onto ECS Fargate in under 10 minutes. We actually uh, run a Node.js shop, so it's a very simple template with all of the bash scripts of uh, the deployment and the build of the system which automatically updates your tasks and services on ECS. So it works uh, really, really well. Feel free to check it out. And last but not least, I wrote a detailed blog post about um, this session explaining all of the uh, steps that we did one by one and the slides for this talk on uh, this URL. And this is basically our journey into ECS Fargate. Thank you very much. Can you turn that? Thank you. Um, OK, so what's next? I have maybe two more minutes of, of talking, and then we'll, we'll open it up for, for some questions. Um, both Shimon and I, by the way, will we'll stick around for a little while to answer questions afterwards. Um, we'll have to take it out of this room, uh, because they're trying very hard to keep in a schedule at the, at the summit. So we'll need to switch the room over for the next talk. Um, so if you, if you want to ask some more questions after this time, um, we'll be outside in the hallway. Um, a couple of things to, to point out before kind of we go. Um, the first thing I, I've already said, but I'll, I'll make it official. Um, our roadmap is driven by feedback from people like you. So let us know if you want a specific feature. You should tell us about it. Tell your account manager. Tell me. Um, I've included some links for, for how you can go about getting started. So join the EKS preview or some blogs on how to work with uh, with Fargate, or uh, there's a link in there to the, the official Container State of the Union from reInvent by Deepak Singh, who is the, the GM of containers at, at AWS. Um, I think more importantly, right, is what happens when, when you leave this room and you're still looking for, for a little bit of help. Um, so there's, there's two Slack communities, if Slack is your thing. Um, the first one is the AWS developer Slack. Um, that's um, that's run by us. Um, it's in a kind of closed beta right now. Um, the best way to get an invite right now is by DMing me on Twitter with your email address. Um, I get a lot of DMs now, so that's exciting. Um, so if you're, if you're looking to join the Slack channel, that's a good way to get started. Uh, there's a second ch Slack channel also that is just for ECS developers, um, and that is community run, not run by AWS. Uh, the AWS developers one has a containers channel in it, um, and lots of, of the DAs and service team members are hanging out there, um, but it also has channels for other things. Um, so there's like a serverless channel and, and stuff like that. So uh, worth a look. Um, or you can always reach out to, to someone from AWS directly. So one of the container DAs or me, um, or Paul Maddox is a, is a specialist SA uh, from the UK. Um, so there's a ton of resources out there for, for getting help. But I think even more importantly than that, um, you should go build and you should tell us about it. So write a blog post, give a talk, um, be like Shimon and come talk at a summit, um, talk at another conference, uh, write a paper for a meetup, write a blog, write a demo. Um, so, so keep building things and, and keep telling us about it. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, if you want to ask questions now, we have eight and a half minutes. Um, yes.